Hey, welcome to Story North, Episode 9. I'm Jay Stevens. Uh, our favorite Martians. <laughs> That's the name of the episode. <laughs> Jeff and I are going to talk about uh, the movie The Martian and the book and how we talk about Mars and some other books like uh, uh, John Carter of Mars. I'm going to bring up some other ones, yeah. too. I don't think, and I think Jeff is ready. What's the current and past world narratives on Mars in general, in the real world. I think we've rewritten the way that we talk about Mars. I think you're right. And we're going to talk about all that stuff. But first, let's do a little house cleaning. Uh, uh, I'm here with Jeff Kamen. By the way, if you haven't noticed, Kim sadly could not make it tonight. It's just the two of us. So you get that bonus. Um, What's up, man? What's going on? Well, let's see. November. It's getting colder. I'm <laughs> okay. You mean how cold it We're... is outside? <laughs> Unbelievable. We got snow so early. Yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> in all honesty, we are recording this in October, but we'll be airing this in November. That's great. I, I just I can't. You can't you I, can't I don't lie. lie about that. No. Okay. Just because, you know, there's just too many too many good things that we would uh have to make up right now. So um we're coming off of what felt like a summer weekend, right? I mean Baseball is still going. Can you believe the it's Cubs like, won the World Series? <laughs> that was the best. <laughs> I cannot believe that Back to the Future got it right. I'm so happy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess it is November. It's very November. It's and those Lynx, and the Lynx won the championship too. Yeah. Can right? you believe that? I assume. The Lynx? <laughs> There's one more game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, right. they won it. Yep, yep. Let's, let's make sure that happens. That's right. Um, and um, the other? Bucks are off to a good start. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> now I know we're talking fiction. <laughs> we're making stuff up here. Uh, but the Packers are still undefeated. As are the Patriots, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they play the, the Patriots before uh, November? No, the Patriots will lose at some point before then. You before so? before the Super Bowl, do you think you think uh, the Packers will go longer undefeated than the Patriots? Well, this this here's the thing. This ties into our topic. There are some people that think Gronkowski is actually from Mars because the guy's unbelievable. He, he is really unbelievable. is. Uh, he is. I'm more afraid of him, I think, than than Tom Brady. When <laughs> assuming that we're on a collision course here with my team versus your team, I guess. Anyways, Martians. Like, but what's going on with you, Jay? No, you asked me, and uh, we we just. Uh, not much is going on. I don't know what to say. I mean, I've been watching and reading a lot about Mars this week. That's pretty much taken up all my time, uh, which is not a bad thing. I actually enjoy science fiction. Kim does not like science fiction. Uh, I think we've established that already, but I'm a huge fan. So uh, this is kind of exciting that I, I'm unfettered. Yeah, this is this is like the taste. classic. Like a, it is like a guy's weekend, right? But it's like you know, uh, the wife is out of town, so you can you know go do something. Maybe you're playing poker. Maybe you're going to see that movie that she wouldn't see. And uh, you did. You went to see The Martian. I saw right? The Martian. And you, I are, saw John Carter of Mars. So yeah, you just had a Mars tacular <laughs> weekend. You no, know, Kim goes and, away. I go see uh, science fiction movies. Right now, did you? Uh, well, first of all, so do you want to start with The Martian, the movie? Well, let's before that, let's uh, let's do our house cleaning, right? We've got a books and bars coming up for December. We do. Speaking of sci-fi, yeah, uh, we are reading a nonfiction book, actually, about science fiction's greatest story of all time. Some might say, some might not. <laughs> uh, it's called How Star Wars Conquered the Universe. It's a book about the making of all of the Star Wars um, saga leading up to. Uh, this latest one that's going to be out in December. Do you know what uh, the release date for the new movie is going to be? <laughs> yeah, I certainly do. What is it's, it? <laughs> it's my wife's birthday. Is it so really? December 18th is so the is, official date. Is she a Star Wars fan? Or are you guys going out to the movie? She for is a fan enough. Yep. It's her birthday movie. Every year there's a movie that's released around that time, and we always – sometimes it's a joke that, oh, look what your birthday <laughs> movie is this year. You know, yeah. um, In the past, it's been things like The Prince of Egypt, the animated film. <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> it's just That one stands out as a, as a memory, but – I was really psyched for her to say, like, look, your birthday movie is, like, the most anticipated movie of the last however many years. It's awesome. very exciting for you. <laughs> yeah, so we'll go as a family, Good. and uh, it'll be fun. Cool. And the uh, discussion is going to take place? Yes, the uh, the book discussion will be the first two Tuesdays in December. The first Tuesday, we're at the Happy Gnome upstairs. Mm-hmm. We have the whole upstairs. It's a lot of fun. And we are still going to be at Indeed's Tap Room in Northeast Minneapolis on the second Tuesday, December cool. 8th. 
And I'm pretty sure that December 8th we'll be recording for Story North Podcast. Yeah, also. let's do indeed. That sounds like a plan. Now, d- will they still have their Growler special? Well, it depends. It, they will if it's the first Growler that you're buying from them. So the first Growler that you buy from Indeed as a Books and Bars member, they're waiving the um, the fee, the $5, like buy the, buy the Growler itself fee. That's cool. So it's like you get a free Growler container. Is that what they're called? Growler yeah, containers, I guess so. Or just the growler, growler itself. Bottle, right? yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be learning a lot more as I spend more time in the tap rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, hopefully I've, they still I've, have Yamma Jamma by December. I I've think never been to Indeed Tavern. Tap room. Uh, tap room, excuse me. Yeah. I've never been to Indeed Tap Room. I'm new to Minneapolis, so I am actually psyched. I've heard a lot of good things about it, so I'm psyched to get down and see you high kick around. They're good high people. High kick people off the stools. Yeah. <laughs> They're good people. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to have them on board with us. Um, we'll have subtext books, uh, selling books there too. They've been uh, supporting us. We're excited about having them on board. The only bookstore in downtown St. Paul. Right. Have you ever been? You, you know where St. Paul is. <laughs> some people don't. Anyway, some people listening to this podcast I think might I got not on be aware. the wrong bus once and ended up there. Yeah. Actually, you ended up getting a job there. Didn't yeah, you? that's right. Uh, I think you showed me where Subtech Books was. So now I know I'm actually, I can't wait to run out and buy some books now at lunch because uh, that's another thing I have to do when Kim's out of town is buy books. Does she limit the amount of books you're allowed to? No, she's like, you can get that at the library or whatever. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's some good things about the library. No, Let's, the library you know, is great. The, I love the library. I love the Friends of the St. Paul Library. They also support I can, you know, we should, we should do a whole show on libraries. I really love libraries. I love libraries. You know My what? mom used to be a librarian. I grew up in libraries. I'm saying right now we will do a library show. Okay, we'll, we'll slot it in at some point. I'm just also I'm just trying to delay you doing our housekeeping because I was hoping you would do it later. <laughs> but go ahead, I'll I'll, I'll let not, you I'll let you do more housekeeping now. A little bit more housekeeping. I just want to tout our social media again. Um, if you haven't visited our uh, Facebook site, our Tumblr site, which is storynorthpodcast.tumblr.com, or our Twitter feed, which is at Story North, please do sign up. Um, we give out there on those sites the links and videos and promos of um, the things that we talk about on the show, and we also talk about upcoming readings and things of interest that um, we as, as uh, literary fans find interesting. I, I think you will too, and it's also great. Um, I don't know, we just say it, it, it complements the show very well. Because uh, we'll talk about some reading, and then boom, I'll have the video. There's a link it. to it. Yep. Yeah, here's a video of what we talked about. You know, read so more, yeah, you know. S- sign up for the social media stuff. We we could really use the followers. We also, um, you know, we're growing our show. So if you can tweet it out, if you like a show, please share that with your friends. Uh, people might be interested. I, I think it's a good cause. <laughs> it's, I think it's an awesome show, honestly. So you, people should listen to it. Jay, if if you don't think that no one else will, so we we do have to believe in ourselves. <laughs> All right. Uh, this all started because The Martian came out, the movie starring Matt Damon. Um, One of the biggest October openings in the history of cinema. A huge hit. You want to sum it up? What's The Martian about? And by the way, this this episode is going to be chock full of spoilers. Yep. So, so is this your, you know, three, warning, from spoil, th- yeah, spoiler, three seconds to uh, go see The Martian. Yeah. Pause this. <laughs> Pause if you this, haven't seen The Martian, and run out and see, see it. it. <laughs> yeah. And then come back to this episode. Or if you've already read the book, maybe, and you don't care as much about what's different, we'll talk about some of the differences. But here we go, two and one, and spoiler zone, we're right. in. <laughs> what's The Martian about? Sum it up for me. Well, The Martian is about an astronaut named Mark Watney, played by Mark Damon, uh, Matt Damon, <laughs> in, in, this, it, uh, in, this, uh, in this story, um, who is left behind on Mars. Uh, his, his crew uh, thinks he's dead. And they uh, leave the planet. They're on a uh, expedition. It's it's set in a. Um, if you know, you know this from the book, I don't believe the movie actually sets the time, but it's about twenty or so years in the future where it is very realistic that we uh, might be sending people to Mars. Right. And uh, he's left behind. And now, if if I were pitching it like a movie, since it <laughs> is, you know, you know how uh, this is what the log line would be. It's essentially three fantastic. Tom Hanks films rolled into one. You have a little bit of Apollo 13, a lot of Castaway, and a little bit of Saving Private Ryan is essentially how this movie breaks down for me. Think about that for a second. I am thinking about yeah. that. Uh, you I, have the, I see you the have, first two, but the third is... Uh, you don't see Saving Private Ryan? No. Let me explain why. Okay. First of all, not only is Matt Damon in this, and he is also, <laughs> he yeah, is sure. also <laughs> Private Ryan... Uh, 
think of it this way. Um, you have a crew that risks their lives. They decide when they find out that he is trapped there to turn around, go back, and get him and add, you know, double their time and space, not knowing if they're going to be able to make it back or not. So it's it's like in Saving Private Ryan, that whole platoon is sent out basically to bring one guy in because his brothers were killed and they didn't want the whole family to sure. die. And so and a lot of them end up dying in Saving Private Ryan. Uh, spoiler alert, they don't <laughs> in The Martian. Um, but so wait, wait, there's wait, a little wait, bit wait. of that. It's they, don't, li- they don't save Private Ryan? <laughs> right. Wait, what are you saying? They, what, they don't they're, die. They don't right, die. Right. So they're, I mean, but they, they do risk their lives. Sure. And I would say, right off the bat, this is one of the hugest differences uh, between the movie and the book. Well, let's get to that in a second. Yeah. I just want to talk about the, uh, the plot a little bit more. Um, one of the interesting things is he's stranded there for over a year. Is that correct? Something like 400... Yeah, days. yeah. It's it, the movie breaks it down to about eighteen months. They say I think right. a year and a half that he hasn't uh, seen anyone else that he's been alone on Mars. And so he has to. Uh, he he's left there on the planet surface with uh, like a little base, right, and no means of communication back to Earth. And he essentially, and he's got enough food for what, like thirty days. Yeah, he's a botanist, so he ends up planting um, and growing potatoes. Right, and he has the potatoes in his hab, um, and basically has he yeah he only had enough food for maybe like a month or two months and then he extends that out and is able to live on potatoes basically for most of that year right that he's stranded there and then in order to be rescued he has to travel across the face of mars for what 3500 kilometers which is uh, over a thousand miles mm-hmm. um and uh using a rover that that has only a uh what about 70 kilometers battery life so it takes him over a month. He has to stop every 12 hours and recharge the batteries. So it takes him over a month, almost two months, to get from the base to this other piece of equipment where he they've left behind some rocket booster um, for uh, 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 you know another rocket from a previous mission. So he has to travel to that in order to, to blast up to his ship, which is return for him, right? Right. So, so uh, the cool thing about all this... And, and, you know, that's just a really quick plot. I mean, it's it's over a two. It's like two and a half hour movie, right? Mm-hmm. The cool thing about it is, it's it's kind of like MacGyver. It's kind of like Apollo thirteen, right? Where um, he has to like uh, do all this crazy setup in order to survive. He's always faced with these challenges. He's always on the cusp of death, right? The whole growing of the potatoes is fascinating because he has to rig up like the solar panels for heat and he has to create water for the crops, right? So he has to hook up hydrogen and create this, uh, you know, fire uh, heat source on, you know, raw hydrogen in order to create um, water, right? Yeah, it's uh, a lot of duct tape is used uh, <laughs> in the movie and in the book. And uh, it, de- it definitely has that MacGyver. I would, I would say if I was, you know, throwing in another part of the pitch, it would definitely be that he... You know, as he says, I'm going to science the shit out of this. Yes, yeah, yeah, it, totally. Is the line. And um, <laughs> if you like the science in the movie, it's it's much more detailed and explained in the book. Yeah. It kind of gives you sort of the the Cliff Notes basic idea. And I like that it is a thinking man's, you know, uh, sci-fi and the idea that, you know, these are, you know, he, he tries these things, he experiments, sometimes it backfires, literally sometimes, you know, these things don't work and he yeah. has to find new ways. I would say, if anything, you know, he has more... Um, more tribulations to overcome in the book. But, you know, it's a book, so it's longer. Sure, and, yeah. and I think they, the movie does do a good job of giving you the core story and the essence of it and being in the same vein. Like, I haven't heard from, you know, we read The Martian as a Books and Bars book, and it was it was one of the better received books of the year. But I haven't heard a lot of people saying that they really didn't like it the way it was that was done. I mean there's a few things you can nitpick about, but sure. I think overall it's it is smarter than your average, you know, um disaster film, you know, sci fi action film. So did you like it? I did. I liked it quite a bit. Yeah. In fact, uh I saw it with my nine year old son because he had read the book also. Oh, and cool. uh and yeah, I think he was the youngest one there, but uh I you know I was, I, think, I, I was thinking after it I is saw PG him, like, thirteen wow, my, my kids is, would actually and it's not too violent it's not too there's scary. a little bit of profanity right I right, mean that's that's, that's it, probably yeah. the biggest thing if you're looking at that and it reminds me of um, the first time I I had the book at home actually and uh, he he had been hearing me talk about it because of books and bars and he wanted to read it and I wasn't sure if I would let him 
partially because of the profanity. Mm-hmm. Well, I said, let me think about that for a second. You know, you could probably read it. I, you know, and I was trying to think of maybe there's something else he should be reading right now. Well, when I wasn't there, he picked it up. And if you know, the, the opening line of the book is very similar <laughs> to one of the things that's said in the movie. But the opening, the first line of the book is, someone pretty much fucked. <laughs> and, uh, and he He's goes, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is what he did. Power to him. This kid, uh, he said, Dad, uh, I picked up that book and I... I read the first page and the F word was there. So I put it away real fast. I, I'm sorry. Oh, I won't read it. And I'm like, your olds are awesome. And I said, you know what, buddy? I go, that's the worst thing. I go, you read it. You saw the word, yeah. you know how it's spelled. Guess what? That happens a couple more times. That's the worst thing in there. That was always trying to protect you from. <laughs> go ahead and read it. If you want to, did you enjoy what you read so far? Yeah. Go ahead. So he did, he read it. He loved it. And, uh, yeah, he liked it too. So I gotta, it's, that's good. Uh, I'll try. Uh, I'll see if my son likes, wants to read it as well. Yeah. That's a, that's a great idea. Or my daughter, you took well. your son to see the movie already. I did not. Oh, okay. I did not. Yeah. You just had a guy's weekend seeing the I Martian. I just went by myself. Yeah. I'm like, okay. I, I tried to get my di- uh, wife to go on a, on a date to it with me. She, she's a big Matt Damon fan. So, um, you know, and it, it got really positive reviews. And it's a good movie. Ridley Scott directed, right? It is. It's a, it's a solid movie. The special effects are amazing. And it's a beautiful movie, right? It's uh, The landscape of Mars is fantastic. You actually feel like you're on Mars. Is it? Did you see it in 3D or not? I did. I saw it in 3D, yes. I thought that was one of the best uses of the 3D. More often, we see just projectiles yeah. coming at you in 3D or right. someone like a superhero flying or something. This was depth, landscape. You know, the It, it gave you a sense of one man being alone yeah. <laughs> on a planet. You know, and it just when he is you know, cruising around in that buggy and there's nothing else out there except for rocks and craters it's right. pretty amazing that was that was a good use of the 3d yeah it's it's cinematically it's a beautiful movie ridley scott is a, of course an amazing director and it's uh, so different from alien right i mean it's you know but still it's a similar well his previous uh yeah and the prometheus was his last movie yeah, before yeah. this one or maybe exodus and kings i mean he's He's got a pretty wide range. I, sure. I, I feel pretty like I'm in pretty good hands with someone like Ridley Scott Absolutely. telling the story. Um, and I think he did a uh, – I think he did – in some ways, it, it's it's more – didn't it feel like a movie that – I don't know. It's I feel like it will be around at awards time, and I feel yes. like it's the kind of movie that you can recommend to your parents and your grandparents. Yes. Like, like everyone l- will like it. It might not be like – you know, it might not have like the biggest I'm message sure, yeah, or he'll some get, any. He'll get some. Dark, will some get, it just feels like Oscar? Oscar. It could be his Oscar. Right? Could be. It yeah. just feels like that movie that like everyone can get behind and absolutely. You know, it's it's a, a feel good, a good family feel good movie. Yeah, um, and there's a positive message I think ultimately because it's it, it is it's about cooperation first of all that it has that you know idea of you know why would this many people risk their lives and spend this much money for one person. But right. it's what we do as humans. And I, and I, I love that, you know, that idea that they, the whole world would get behind this. We're going to bring this guy back. That's, it's interesting. Now, Jeff Daniels played the head of NASA in this, and, and um, he sort of played the bad guy as much as there is any bad guy in this movie. He was making a lot of decisions around the mission to um, always with an eye towards public relations, always with an eye towards the least harm, as opposed to the the biggest reward, um, you know, the, you might call him a typical administrator, but he also he didn't come across as unsympathetic. Like the decisions he made, you understood and seemed rational. And the way he put it, it's like, yeah, you, okay, if we lose all the crew, we might lose NASA, right? We may lose space exploration. So it's bigger than the lives of just six people, and and his budget and maybe the future of science, right? Maybe at stake on this crazy plan, right? So in some ways, it is a rational decision not to risk the life of a larger ship and a larger crew for a single astronaut, right? So, um, yeah, it's, that's about as, as bad as anyone gets in this movie. Yeah, and I think that uh, it's interesting because the um, if, if anyone is maybe... Uh, it's a great cast, uh, but Kristen Wiig plays um, the... Press secretary, like the yeah, uh, the, yeah, the public yeah. relations person, right. and she uh, she actually had to deliver more of that bad news to the press that was maybe decided by the director, um, the Jeff Daniels character in the book, and then whereas in the movie, um, it's it comes straight from him, like he takes the 
you know, he, yeah, he, right. he actually, and I think in some ways that made him more sympathetic in the sense that even though he was questioning whether this is worth it and can we jeopardize this, he was also saying this one's on me yes. a couple times. And yeah. he was, you know, he was one going forward and said it wasn't tested. You know, we didn't, we didn't test this, you know, and that's why this one failed in that, in that right. instance and stuff. I, d- I do want to talk about the book a little bit more in detail. But first, um, I, d- I do want to have a couple more comments about the movie. Yeah. One is it, it uh, seemed so familiar to uh, – almost the same as Apollo 13 in tone and message, right? Yep. Um, Which is why, have you seen, a lot of people actually were confused and thought that this was based on a true story. Right, yes, yeah, you sent me that link. Was, <laughs> but it, it's also a testament to how well done the movie was yeah. and how believable the technology was, right? Right. I mean, it, it wasn't fantastic. Like, you don't see the spaceships and think, oh, that'll never happen, or the, or the yeah. spacesuit, or even the, the – the base on Mars, they all seem like reasonable and realistic things. Right? Sure. And all the science, I, from what I've heard, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it, but it did feel a lot like Apollo 13 in yep. tone and tenor. I do think, I mean, Damon was hilarious and the movie had a, a great funny streak, but I do think Tom Hanks does cheese better than, uh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, but, I think he does cheese better than Matt Damon. He's got that kind of, uh, I don't know. He does that little. His mouth gets all pinched up, and he's like, Ooh, you know. And he he has that speech that's understated, you know. And you're like, oh, you get kind of teary and choked up when Tom Hanks delivers. Oh, it. okay. So and, you're and saying Matt that Damon's the... speech at the end seemed a little heavy-handed and and. Uh, you're t- are you clumsy. saying the speech that he gives uh, to the class? Yes, like at when the end. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that, uh, well. You know, if we're going to throw, I mean, Tom Hanks has has a few years on Matt Damon, so maybe when Matt Damon is. Maybe he'll grow. Were they, maybe he'll were that different in age when when Hanks made uh, Apollo, Apollo 13? thirteen? Ooh, this is worth looking up. Yeah, so I, I would 13, suspect they're yeah. run. In fact, uh, it feels like a similar career trajectory, right? It sounds okay. like it feels like Matt Damon. This feels like a vehicle for Oscar, right? I yeah. mean, it's it may be Matt Damon's entry as a major family, you know, quality movie star, right? Yeah, I think that. Uh, I mean, Tom Hanks is great. You're not gonna. I'm not gonna. Say, no, no, he's uh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, I I had heard Andy Weir, the author of the book, has said that the other person, the only other person that he kind of envisioned as being cast, and I think it's because of the age thing at this point, was uh, Chris Pratt. But, I mean, Chris Pratt can't yeah. play everyone. <laughs> right. I mean, I could totally see Chris Pratt sure. playing this part also and probably you he know, would, it would really have been well. a funnier movie with Chris it Pratt. It would have been probably, yeah, uh, maybe, which the book has a lot of, a lot of comedy in it. Yeah. You know, there's... Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, but yeah, to I say the movie could, yeah. the movie didn't move me like it was a entertaining, sure. quality, amazing movie, but it wasn't. I didn't feel like, you know what I mean. It it, it was good, but it yeah. didn't it didn't make me it totally, didn't, yeah. it didn't move me. It didn't shake my understanding of the world. It didn't you know it, like great art or yeah. whatever. I mean, there's quotations around that it does. It wasn't a kind of movie that that blasted any doors down or made me think about things any differently. And uh, you might be right about that. Um, I would say that I was, you know, I'm not this tough if you're going to compare it directly to the emotional heft that you felt from Apollo 13, knowing that that was based on a true story, right, right. you know, versus this one. Um, I was into it. You know, I, I, I wanted him to get saved. I knew yeah, he yeah. was going to because I had read the book, and yeah. I'm sure they weren't going to change that part. Sure. But uh, I was still, you know, emotionally invested in it. Um, it's a, as it's far a as, very good movie. Yeah, as far as, like, what my takeaway is, though, I think I do go back to this idea that, um, you know, uh, China and the U.S. worked together on this. The whole world was kind of behind it, and right. and there wasn't – you didn't have a lot of those, why would we do this just for one person? It was it was kind of, you know, the the guy in charge of everyone's – uh, the whole crew had to think about that for a bit, but then it was like, guess what? That crew didn't have to think about it for a second. It right. was a unanimous split decision. Well, they did leave. Of course, we're going to turn around <laughs> right. and get our yeah, guy. Yeah, you know, yeah. we don't leave a guy behind. Yeah. And this is, you know, these are astronauts are not necessarily, um, you know, you maybe understand that more from a military story right. standpoint. Um, but, you know, I liked how they showed that they were all risking something in the sense of, you know, this, this guy is married with a couple kids at home and his wife is upset that he's going to be spending extra time out there, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, that was it was, uh, but yeah. So, talk to me about the book. Like, yeah. how did how did the book difference? What, what were the most significant ways that the book differed from the movie? Well, the I mean, the absolute biggest difference, and I think it's one of the only complaints that I've heard from some people about the book is uh, uh, the book has a fairly abrupt ending. It ends with him being saved, and then kind of making a joke about how bad he smells, and he says, "You know, this is the greatest day of my life." And 
you you never you never see the crew um come back home you never see like the celebration on earth or anything like that there's there's not that whole thing um the movie's epilogue was was a bit longer but i thought that it was it was actually really good in the sense that uh it gave you just that little bit more that people might have wanted if they were into these characters because another thing that the movie does differently is it it focuses more on on the uh the crew and on what's happening on earth the book has a solid for the a solid one third of the book. It's you like if you didn't know anything going into it. Like when I first heard about the book, I was actually like, "Oh, is he gonna? Is there gonna be alien life of some? Is he gonna run into a Martian?" Right, you right. find out at a certain. You're like, "Okay, he's the Martian. I get right, it." And right. it's all about you're. What if you were the only person? You know, on a planet, he, and he, he grows crops, yeah, and, and he, he says, becomes, "I co- yeah. I find out that I colonized this planet right. uh, technically officially." But the book is uh, like one third of it is just Mark Watney, and you don't even get like. And then later you get the backstory a little bit more about the crew, and then once they get involved, uh, there's there's some of that communication. But it's it's almost it's so much more a solitary thing of like one guy in his head right. and doing those logs and trying to figure it out. And every problem that is kind of maybe you fail once and then you figure it out in the movie. Uh, it, they're just a little more difficult and a little more explained in the book. Um, so it, people could really get behind that. And that science was researched. Uh, uh, it's interesting that Andy Weir had initially put this book. I don't know if you know the story. He had mm. put this book out there for free. Oh, and really? it was, That's he cool. had a website and he was like putting out a chapter when it was done. Yeah. And he got thousands and thousands of readers like clamoring for more and then saying, Hey, it's not convenient for me to read it this way. Can you put it on Amazon? And still make it free. He's like, yeah. Uh, and then he came back. He said, actually, they're making me charge ninety nine cents. But here it is. It's the cheapest I can give it away for ninety nine cents. If you otherwise, you can get it for free on my website. Well, he ended up getting so many downloads. So many people bought it for a buck. So many people got it for free. That major publisher, Crown, got involved and gave him a huge advance. And almost instantly, then the film rights were bought. And that's how it all kind of got fast tracked right. so quickly to get made into a film. But he was. Uh, first time, first time author. I mean, he was a programmer, and he and he was putting it out there, and he would get feedback from people that worked as scientists, worked at oh, NASA, cool. and yeah. said, "Actually, this part's a little wrong." Like if you sh- <laughs> and he would then change it. Right. He would fix it. So over time, if anything, the book has gotten more accurate um, right, right. T- to this publication. There's a few things that are uh, that he talks about that were completely made up, and that's the idea that a sandstorm could be that powerful probably isn't accurate right. um at least what we currently know about mars so but he needed some kind of inciting incident to sure. separate the two right. and there's actually two big sandstorms in the book the the drive you're talking about that takes so long where he has to keep recharging his batteries mm-hmm. um he falls into a crater at one point and he also has to dodge another storm that's coming and that part was all taken from taken the movie out, yeah. And, yeah and uh, the end was kind of i don't want to say it was rushed but it, you know there was uh it, it was definitely a quick pace at the end you know i'm looking at my watch i'm like oh, we've been here for almost two hours and he's just setting out with his rover right i mean we don't have much time left to get him that's interesting I, in fact f- from my point of view the in the movie the best part of the, the movie was um uh, mark watney's internal life like him talking and yeah. In doing these problems, so that it sounds like that was taken directly from. Then the I book. think you you should read the book. Yeah, I'd I'm it, I'm 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 planning on it. It's even uh, even though I know what's going to happen and everything like that. All right. So yeah, The Martian is a uh, you know it's a, a very cool uh, movie. But one of the things that attracted me towards it was that it's about Mars, and there's a lot of literature about Mars, um, which we want to talk about a little bit. But before that, let's uh, I want to talk about some of the shows through our network, Alive and Social. Um, one of them is the Twin Cities Hit Show, which is an online radio show broadcast live from the Twin Cities Monday through Thursday at 9.30 a.m. Each day, you'll hear hilarious commentary about the latest news from your hosts, Rusty Gatenby, you know, former KSTP traffic and entertainment reporter, comedian uh, Colleen Justice, and former Bloomington cop turned comedian Chuck Gollop. Uh, they do and say things local morning shows can't or won't. And to listen and learn more, visit liveandsocial.com. One other liveandsocial.com uh, show is uh, Joan of Art. Joan of Art is a weekly podcast um, that investigates and celebrates people who make art 
Joan Verbruggen invites you into a discussion with artists from every corner of the universe. New episodes uploaded every Monday. To learn more, visit aliveandsocial.com as well. So one of the first um, books or pieces of literature that actually um, brings extraterrestrials into it is War of the Worlds, which came out in 1897. It was written by H.G. Wells. Um, H.G. Wells was a socialist and a pacifist, a um, biologist and a journalist. He also wrote, of course, like The Time Machine, Invisible Man, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Um, but what I found interesting is that War of the Worlds, uh, written about an invasion of Martians on, on these tripod machines, and they, like, obliterate most of the population. Um, it was written in response to British imperialism at the time. Uh, apparently, H.G. E. Wells was really sickened by uh, the treatment of Australian aborigines by um, British. And he wanted to show the British what it would be like to be colonized by a technologically advanced society. Um, so it's really what I found really cool about that is is Mars is like a symbol like Martians um, carry not just you know ray guns and exterminating rays but kind of like a symbolism they carry the weight of imperialism on their shoulders right um, and the next I, this is one I know we both want to talk about a little bit is the uh, John Carter of Mars which is by Edgar Rice Burroughs and that was written that was written actually not much uh, not much later. Um, the first book uh, of that series, The Princess of Mars, uh, was published as a book in uh, first, excuse me, as serial uh, chapters in pulp, pulp magazines in 1912, right? Um, and written by Edgar Rice Burroughs, who was born in Chicago, was actually um, a son of a Civil War soldier, and he served in the uh, 7th U.S. Cavalry in Arizona in the late 1800s. And um, uh, and then later, after he served in the cavalry and came back home, he ended up getting a clerkship job in a pencil shar- as a in a pencil sharpener wholesaler. Right. So here's this guy, like, literally pushing <laughs> pencils in some like East Coast uh, factory after wor- you know being out in the fighting Apaches in the uh, American West, and he writes this completely fantastical world that's extremely rich in detail and imagination. Um, just real quick, the basic premise is there's uh, a Confederate soldier who's out prospecting in the West who stumbles across a, a forbidden Native American cave and, I don't know, touches I, – I don't remember exactly what happens in the book, but he ends up being transported to Mars through some weird mystical experience. And there he gets adopted by these 15-foot-tall green aliens with six sword-wielding aliens with six arms who um, – uh, kind of had this harsh code of justice and family. And he ends up uh, uh, earning his way among them through his fighting prowess. He can jump a long way. He's got extraordinary strength because he was um, born on Earth and has the musculature of an Earthman but is on a, um, a lower gravity planet in Mars and is able, you know, has, has uh, comparatively, he's much stronger. And he ends up uh, um, fighting for the city-state of Helium and finding a princess, uh, Dejah Thoris, and... and uh, you know, having relations with her and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a fantastic book. It's extremely detailed. Um, uh, did you have, did you read those when you were a kid, John? I, I didn't, but it, I know that going back to it always comes back to Star Wars for me. Yeah. George Lucas was completely inspired by by what Edgar Rice Burroughs was doing with that, and and pulled a lot of of great things from it. And it, just the way you described it now, I'm also reminded that you know that Superman originally didn't fly; he was leaping. Right. Tall yes. He was leaping much like right. what John Carter's ability was because of gravity. Right. Um, I have seen um, the film version, which the. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a well, second because well there but... are some there are some really uh, big differences between the book and the film. So um, you read these when you were younger? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I read those. I read Tarzan. I read. Do, uh, yeah. What do you think uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs was trying to say versus what H. G. Wells was saying? How is it? You it's because I think he's commenting on something yeah. here too, isn't he? Well, it's it's a lot more. I don't want to say complicated because it's a pulpier uh, novel. H. G. Wells was writing, I think what even then was considered literature, right? It was a fantastic novel. Um, Edgar Rice Burroughs was writing for pulp magazines, and it was kind of that lowbrow um, writing style and the lowbrow, you know, like everyone on, on Mars is naked all the time, right? And uh, so, you know, your our lured imaginations are, you know, picturing Deja Thoris and John Carter, you know, traipsing naked through the sands of Mars together, right? Um, 
He's so my, my lord. Anyways, so <laughs> I'm going off on so, it. something you read when Kim's out of town. Yeah, yeah, totally, is, is that. totally. But um, you know, it is still an interesting. Uh, I don't say theory, but the guy was enamored with like the lost cause of the South, with these notions of aristocracy and honor and um, prowess of martial arts. Like sword fighting was huge in this this society. And w- one of the more interesting things is that the Tharks, these green six-armed aliens um, resemble Native American tribes actually quite a bit in custom and demeanor, any ways that he imagined Native Americans to be like. Um, And there is a lot of respect for them in the book. But um, essentially, it's like a big Western set on Mars. And what's interesting about this book is it took place right uh, at the time when Everything in the earth is known. Everything's been explored. There is no more west. There's no more frontier. There's no more um, really wilderness areas to explore other than, you know, up the Nile or at the bottom of the sea or whatever. Uh, and, and in a sense, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs was putting the frontier out in space. Like, oh, yeah, there is a place we can go and test our metal and continue to develop and grow as Americans specifically um, – you know, even though our wilderness is is gone. And right now it's in my imagination, right? Um, But yeah, the the landscape of Mars is very Western. There's, it's arid, there's no more seas. It's a big desert. It resembles, you know, the Arizona when he was in the Calvary. You have the Tharks, which are like the Native Americans. You have the Red Men, which are uh, the civilized beings. Um, But there's also this weird like racial element to it. Like races are very starkly defined. Uh, They have a long history Um, they're very important in this world. Uh, I think there's been a lot of criticism of that, sort of calling him a neo-colonial because he's, you know, he's this white guy who's super strong, who's um, bringing Anglo-Saxon values to Mars, right? Uh, But on the other hand, for his time and place, I mean, I think that's an insensitive view of of the book because for his time and place, he was actually pretty advanced, uh, racially speaking. He wasn't... And it sounds like he, he, as a character, has John Carter... uh, almost appropriating a lot of the things that he likes. Like, he does fall. Like, he, he right. likes this culture, right? Yes, He's yeah. not necessarily He goes to, native in a way. Yeah, he, he wants to learn from them. He wants to adopt uh, And he wants to stay. Doing. He doesn't yeah. want to come back. Exactly. Yeah. I remember that aspect of it uh, and falling in love and yeah, right. wanting to be there instead. Um, what I'm wondering about is, so this was, you said, like 1912, 1912, maybe? yeah. And you it's know, also right before the First World War and when people were enamored of Still enamored of war and thought it glorious, mm-hmm. honorable, right? And that's the kind of yeah. There's a lot of sword by the, You know, yeah. uh, we're done with the Civil War, uh, so there's still, but there was that element of that that he was a Civil War soldier, right? You're saying. Yeah. Um, and we say now, I mean, the final frontier is actually that, right. uh, you know. I mean, this was some imagination that he's going ahead to, thinking, well, we, you know, we're done with the West. What if we were exploring right. these other yes. planets? Yeah. And it's literally where we are now. I, I mean, other than. You know the depths of the ocean. We're, we're pretty much looking for th- other places now. We're looking for water on Mars. Right. Yeah. Uh, the movie. Let's talk about the movie. You saw the movie, right? Yeah. What do you did. think of the movie? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it's I, got it's gotten panned. It didn't make yeah, any money. It was I, kind of a flop. I liked it. Um, I think you know it was one of those ones where your expectations are so lowered because I didn't see it in the theater and it was considered like one of the big flops of the year and. And I think it got really bad reviews. And then they were saying, you know, this actor, Taylor Kitsch from Friday Night Lights, he just can't, you yeah, know, he can't yeah. be in a blockbuster because he was also in um, Battleship based on the board game and that bombed. And these are like yeah. these big you know, studio tentpole things. So um, he wasn't bad. I didn't think he was, he was okay. Yeah, he was okay. I mean, he's no Matt Damon. No. <laughs> or Tom Hanks. <laughs> no. But, uh, you know, Chris Pratt would have been really good as yeah. John Carter. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, I, know it back then. I don't know. I think in some ways, uh, you can't have someone that treats that role jokingly. Too jokingly. Yeah, because right. it kind of ruins the so whole... So the stoicism of, you know, that, that sort of... That In fact, quiet... even, even he was a little too jokey or too boyish for that role, I thought. Okay. Yeah. Who would you put as John Carter then? I'd put someone, uh, I don't know, a young Kevin Spacey. I don't know, someone very <laughs> serious and, you know... <laughs> you're going to say Kevin Costner. Or, you know, like uh, The Rock. Like some, uh, like one of those uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a oh, young that. man. Time out. Have, has, has anyone, have we ever seen a young Kevin Spacey? <laughs> no. As long as I've known Kevin Spacey, he's, <laughs> he's never been, like been 50, young. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think, I don't know if a young Kevin Spacey exists. Yeah. I, I, I have a very hard time picturing him as, as younger than 40. What were the That's... movie's strengths? <laughs> what do you think? Would you like? Um, well, 
you know, I thought actually it was it was clever. There was I was surprised by some of the um, the twists and turns, and and I credit I want to believe Michael Shabon had something to do with that. He was one of the screenwriters. I love I love his uh, his yeah. books. Yeah. Um, I thought si- the uh, special effects were great. It was good action. Um, I was I was into it. I was yeah. involved. I I did think it was fun. And uh, I ended up watching it with my kids, and the bar was so low that it was, you know, it was probably like a red box rental or something at yeah. the time, and it was like, uh, you know, just something to watch with the kids, and we all enjoyed it quite a bit. And we were all kind of like, "Hey, that was good." Yeah, I thought but, the, I think the special effects were good too, and it yeah. really caught the the flavor of the books. Well, like the the, um, the the machines, the flying machines, the costumes, the the the, the city in the desert and stuff. I thought I thought that would, they did really well, and uh, yeah, the dialogue and they changed a bunch of stuff, of course, right? The Deja Thoris wasn't a helpless, you know, shapely princess only. She was also uh, a sword wielding scientist in the movie, right? Yeah. Um, and they That's... did they did downplay. There was this one part in the book where uh, John Carter sort of becomes like a missionary among the Tharks to, you know, uh, to become <laughs> to adopt more of nuclear families. And you know, the the movie hints at it a little bit where the the main Thark character has a daughter, and normally they don't recognize their own children. So there's this daughter father connection in the movie. In the books, it's a lot more pronounced. He actually works actively to destroy the tradition of. Um, so could it could it be argued that John Carter of Mars is one of the first times um, in literature that, or maybe any pop culture that we see the good Martian or the friendly Martian or the one as opposed to the what we got mostly after that, especially in the yeah. 50s and and sort of that that fear, that paranoia that they're going to get us, you know, there's aliens are going to come and conquer us, you know, what we saw in War of the Worlds, yeah. that sort of a thing. All right, can you think of, I mean, are there more well, where the aliens are, fr- the Martians are friendly, yeah. you know, like Marvin the Martian from Bugs Bunny right. kind of thing. Right. Um, I, you know, <laughs> hello, Earthling. Yeah. Uh, versus, to, um, yeah, you know, the, uh, what, what the What's, tripod machines are and yeah. stuff. Because I, I, I guess when I think of, you know, like classic f- 1950s sci-fi right i think of it's us versus them you know it's right. it's alien invaders um i don't want to i did want to talk about ray bradbury a little bit in this podcast but we don't you know running out of time and it's very complex but um you know bef- in his martian chronicles he has a very sophisticated um depiction of martians they are neither good nor bad but simply an ancient and complex civilization that has been destroyed by American imperialism, right? So, yeah, so the Martians, they speak a foreign language, they have their own traditions, and when the Earthlings come, they don't quite understand what they're seeing and destroy them by accident, essentially. Like in one of the short stories, um, everyone on Mars assumes the American astronauts are insane, and they commit them to an insane asylum because people on Mars can actually project their hallucinations so that they look real. So they see the rocket ship, and they go, oh, wow, that's a really interesting insanity right so we're going to put you in the insane asylum and then euthanize you to put you out of your misery david lynch can do that actually <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's pretty but impressive there's a there's a good quote by bradbury he says edgar rice burroughs uh, never would have looked upon himself as a social mover and shaker with social obligations but as it turns out and i love to say it because it upsets everyone terribly burroughs is probably the most influential writer in the entire history of the world Ray Bradbury said that. Ray Bradbury said that about Edgar Rice Burroughs and John Carter of Mars. And you mentioned before John Carter had all this influence on... uh, On George Lucas. On George Lucas, but he had it on Ray Bradbury. He had it on all these other... uh, He actually had a number of astrophysicists and rocket scientists from World War II, right, who loved reading his books as kids and got into science because of John Carter. Um, But yeah, um, I think... We also saw a couple Twilight Zone episodes. I think that's where you're headed, right? Like, uh, Martians are always, you know, these weird creatures, especially in these 1950s, 1960s, you know, during the Red Scare uh, of post-World War II America. Martians are the invasion of the body snatchers. Absolutely. Did you you watch both Twilight Zone episodes that that we picked out? Uh, I watched uh, from season one (laughs) of Twilight Zone, uh, episode 22, the one where it's on Main Street. The monsters are due on Maple Street. That's one of the most famous episodes in Twilight Zone. You want to sum up that, uh, that plot, what happens in that? Well, uh, let's see. The way the way I saw it is basically you have a uh, like a nice suburban Main Street USA, and uh, there's some sort of um, like a noise, and, and 
like a light flashes and people say, oh, a, maybe a meteor came too close um, to the earth or something like that. And then uh, all of their electricity goes out and none of their cars work. And it's just this paranoia of um, how come the lights in your house just flashed or how come your car started and my car didn't start? And what's that weird thing you're doing with the ham radio in the garage? Who are you talking to? And, and it's everyone in this small community just starts um, getting paranoid about all their neighbors and and basically they they start hurting each other uh, uh killing each other off accidentally yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh and the reveal is in like a, in a classic twilight zone fashion i often think of the twilight zone episodes as you know really just like a good short story with that twist right there's right, just that yeah. like awesome ending and uh you know the, the camera pulls back to see this this small main street in complete chaos and everyone's um you know hating on their neighbor and destroying each other and and it's like a like a mob has happened and we have uh two men who look like just white suburban gentlemen that might have been in the main <laughs> street but they're wearing you know 1950s kind of sci-fi yeah. um costumes and they have like a headset and one says to the other, yeah, that's all you have to do is, you know, take away there. And this hit me so hard. He basically, and this is what, from like 19, 1960. 60. Yeah. He says a comment that could have been applied to today if, if we lost our iPhone or if we lost our internet for, for like, an hour right. how we would react he's like you take away some of their electricity you take away some of their he even says he's like you take away their phones their electricity their, you, you make it so their lawnmowers and their cars don't start and they'll turn on each other <laughs> like in a day right. he's like and we can repeat this pattern across the hips like yep we'll just keep doing this everywhere and basically they'll and, and that's right. that they'll just destroy themselves all we have to yeah. do and i just think of it now like all we would have to do is have our internet taken away and we would be at each yeah. other yeah but actually, but we'd finally be interacting again, though. So there'd be that that positive aspect of it, even though I'd be <laughs> punching you physically. Right. You know, at least, at least, at least I notice you, because right. otherwise I'm just staring at my screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that that was uh, in response, I think, in part to McCarthyism, right? So there are all these red scares. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's trying to it, it's trying to find out like yeah what what secret thing is your is your is your neighbor right. part of this organization that you don't know about? Right. Like how yeah turning on each other and destroying your own society for your enemy. And it, but one of the interesting things is that the Martians are the enemy. They are like these, I mean, there's no doubt to Rod Sterling and Twilight Zone that communists are the enemy, right? It's that they're sneaky infiltrating, you know, and that they could be among us working to destroy us and we, we can't let them do that, right? Um, the other episode I point to, which you didn't see, but it's, it's, it's called Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up? There's again another crash of a spaceship and then the police follow footsteps through the snow from the crash to this diner. And they go in a diner, and there's there's a bunch of people there, and it's people off a bus. And there are seven passengers, and uh, six passengers, a bus driver, and um, uh, the diner guy. And, and they're like, well, how many people? You know, it turns out there's one extra person yeah. in the diner, right? So they kind of go through this episode trying to figure out who it is. And, and that, and that, and it, it reminded me in same thing in that first episode. And, and you, I think you mentioned the thing, it's that idea. And, and like invasion of the body snatchers is that it's one of us is not right. But like, we yeah. don't know, like we all look kind of the same right. and, and we can't really tell, but we're going to find out like which one of us is not, does not belong or is the imposter or is doing something. But it's the, it's that search. It's that yeah. desire to find out who's not like us that destroys us. It's not the actual threat. It's the, yeah. this, the, the infighting that, that, you know, occurs because of that. Um, yeah, so, you know, from War of the Worlds, comment on imperialism to Edgar Rice Burroughs, like, you know, renewal of the American frontier to Twilight Zones, uh, you know, anti-communist message. M Martians have always played, you know, some very heavy, or Mars itself has played a heavy symbolic role in kind of what we're thinking about as a culture, right? Um, so what about the Mar let's go back to the Martian. What now? So would you go to Mars if you could? Well, who's the Martian, right? It is now <laughs> us. Yes. Right. We're well, uh, the Mark Watney character is, yeah. is definitely the Martian yeah. in, in the book and the film. He is the Martian. Um, you know, what have we found now in, you know, in the real world? Uh, there's evidence of water on yep. Mars. Yep. Uh, next thing is I'm sure we'll find some kind of microcosm, some kind of organism, right? Some where there's water, there can be life. 
But Not what, saying what, there's going to be a green, a little green yeah. man, but you know, are but we going to? What itch, what like national or cultural itch are we scratching with this movie? What is this movie talking to us? What is it saying to us that that we find so appealing in this movie? Well, I think it might be the idea that our, have we completely trashed um, our home here to the point where we have to go somewhere else and start over? You know, uh, we we won't have enough resources, we won't have enough room, we won't have what it takes for our great grandkids to to make it here. Mm-hmm. So if we can find you know that a new frontier where there's water uh, yeah. is there a chance of you know living somewhere else if if we've burned out this one yeah i i think that new frontier thing is is really it like it goes back to the edgar rice burroughs i think there's this belief that if we have a new frontier to challenge ourselves on we'll renew our greatness as, as an american culture because right now we don't i would right. argue we don't so feel we, that great we need about another ourselves. space race in a way yeah. you're saying like that would it would increase jobs and it would give us like a goal like an, a th- something we can all get behind I, th- I think that's what the movie is saying yeah yeah okay. do you agree i mean would you are you for manned well i think trip to to mars it, it is uh i would go yeah i mean i and but i mean I would you would you think it's a would you say we had you know, like uh, I don't know, fifty billion, or would it probably be two hundred billion dollars, probably be more than. That. Let's let's say five trillion dollars. You got five trillion bucks. You can pick one project to put it behind. It would be this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it like some. You know, would it be a m- manned mission to Mars? Would you? You know. Would oh you... boy. Well, okay, that's a that's a big one. There. Yeah, because that's because I, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, that's what's if it, I guess right? I would believe that if it was five trillion dollars, I would definitely be looking for the way to. You know, help as many people as possible. Right. Is is that? Are we going to find that by exploring? You know, other planets and space. Is is that what's going to help us? I don't know. Is there a way to use that five trillion to reverse some of the damage that we've done here and to save what we have here? Right. You know, I might I might still look to that first then, um, but I don't know. Because essentially, that's what a manned mission to Mars would challenge us. I mean, it isn't. You, you, there isn't an infinite sum of money, right? If you divert. The money it would take to build a mission to Mars, you are diverting it from some other place, right? So there, we, we would be making a choice. I mean, would you say uh, you had two options, right? A manned mission to Mars or um, was a Green New Deal. Have you heard of this? Uh, so progressives were talking about, you know, taking – instead of um, – you know, to, to get us out of the recession, we should spend a ton of money giving people jobs in the green sector to, you know, reinvent or reinvigorate energy consumption. So we, you know, we would put up solar panels and windmills instead of, you know, sink all the money into alternative energy instead of, uh, you know, fossil fuel energy or, you know, redoing our infrastructure so that it's it's it doesn't use fossil fuels which would you pick right if you have oh, two boy. options oh boy i didn't i didn't know we were doing a political <laughs> podcast here I'm no not. i'm just curious uh, cuz I, I will say this i just joined the co-op how about that you got to start you got to start locally right so, so. cuz i do think this idea of the frontier right i mean it's a moral renewal of a people mm-hmm. right so some might argue that's more important than yeah it you know, might be it yeah. might be i don't want to take away the space though but you like you, you know, think space travel is cool I do. I think it's really cool. So you would go I, on. You would go on a man mission. I would. To man I would. And maybe I would bring. What if any, you couldn't anyone come back? who read the book could come with me? What if you couldn't come back? Uh, I don't like that aspect as much, unless um, unless I was maybe far enough along in my life that you know it was going to be maybe the last twenty years of my life or something. Yeah. Um, but. Oh, I think I. You want to come back? Unless <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, to me, it's still the idea that it w- the next. I mean, the next step is, you know, you're, you're still living in a suit. You're still living in a bubble of some sort. Like yeah. It, it, you wouldn't feel like natural environments. I mean, maybe it's not Mars. Maybe there's still something else that is out there. Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if I'd want to go. I mean, it's a long trip, <laughs> <laughs> and you'd have to stay a long time, right? I mean, practically speaking, to make it. Yeah. And make it worth your while. Yeah, definitely. Well, there was that Mar- was it Mars One program where they were actively recruiting colonists who would volunteer to go there and not come back. Yeah, do you remember that? Yeah, and a bunch of people signed up for it. So yeah. there is, there is that desire among a lot of people well, to go. Well, maybe when they Mars. leave, um, then we'll have enough resources here. Maybe that's it. Maybe <laughs> you can go to Mars people. if you want to go. Can't be and good then for the, rest the climate. Of the climate, <laughs> but all that more rocket fuel. 
Oh man, you're so <laughs> anti the space program. <laughs> I'm not. You know what? Um, you like Mars and books. You know what I like? I, I love Mars and books. You're absolutely right. Like the. But what if California needs water so badly that we have to somehow learn something from Mars about how to get more water? Uh, I mean that's a hypothetical, right? <laughs> I guess it all is. I don't know. I just think um, you know the Mars rovers are cool. Like, they're, what's the purpose of putting a person on the planet? It doesn't make any sense. Like to me, there's no reason. Like robots can do everything better and cheaper, right? So why bother? Don't say that they're going to take over this podcast. We should send them all. <laughs> we should send all those damn robots to Mars. Is what I'm saying. We should definitely do a robot episode. We should totally do a, a robot an AI. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for us. Thanks for listening. <laughs>